It is 7.01, so I'm going to start the webinar. My name is Meg Sheehan, and welcome to part one of our three-part webinar series on New York's proposal to bring more hydropower from Canada to New York City. This webinar is hosted by North American Mega Dam Resistance Alliance. I'm bringing up my slides right now. We are a volunteer-led alliance of groups whose mission is to protect rivers and their communities. The title of our webinar today is Why Importing Canadian Hydroelectricity is a Bad Deal for New York and Frontline Community. I'll go over a few protocols for our webinar this evening. Our Five speakers will speak from 8 to 9 p.m. I'm sorry, 7 to 8 p.m. And from 8.30, from 8 to 8.30, we will have a question and answer. We're going to ask people to be muted, muted during the presentations, and then we'll unmute everyone at the end for a Q&A. We'll be showing some slides. If you're on a phone line and you would like us to, to email those to you, let us know. We have a phone number that you can text for help during the webinar, or you may call as well. And I'll give you that number right now if you'd like to write it down. It's 207-251-3187. We'll also be li live streaming on Facebook. And if you'd like to send us a message on Facebook, you may do that as well. It's on Resist Mega Dams on our Facebook page. So we're here to talk about the Champlain Hudson Power Express Transmission Corridor. I'll be referring to it as CHPY, C-H-P-Y. This is a 330 mile transmission corridor to import up to 1,250 megawatts of hydroelectricity generated by the government of Quebec and its agent Hydro-Quebec from large dams in Canada. The cost of the project is $3 billion, that's for the construction. If there is ever a contract between New York and the government of Quebec to purchase this electricity, it's estimated that New Yorkers, the purchasers will pay about $600 million a year to buy electricity from Quebec. This project faces an uphill regulatory battle on both sides of the border. In addition to these questionable economics, the project is fundamentally immoral. The world is re-examining issues of racism, discrimination, and colonialism in all its forms. The Canadian hydropower industry is the ultimate manifestation of racism and discrimination. The industry exists only because of government policies that sanction systemic state-sponsored violence and that condone the reckless exploitation of Aboriginal people, communities, rivers, and forests for energy production. This continues today. In addition to the Chippy Corridor, more hydropower corridors are planned to export this energy from Canada to the Northeast US. Most of the hydroelectricity sold by Hydro-Quebec today and proposed for these corridors comes from large dams built on Aboriginal lands without the consent and often without the knowledge of the Aboriginal people who occupied the land for millennia. These are some of our Indigenous land and water protectors in Ottawa explaining why 
dams kill and a proposal for returning the land to the indigenous people. I'd like to give her a perspective of where these dams are located. They're over 1,200 miles from New York City. You can see here on the map in the upper left, James Bay, where some of Hydro-Quebec's largest dams are located. And over on the right-hand side of the screen, the Churchill Falls Dam in Labrador that Hydro-Quebec uses today. These are two of the largest dams in Hydro-Quebec's uh, portfolio. They were built in the 1970s without the consent of Aboriginal people. Together, these two dams drain and dike 56,000 square miles, an area the size of the state of New York. They're the ninth and 10th largest dams in the world, and they are only two of the 62 dams that Hydro-Quebec uses to supply electricity. The environmental and social injustices of Canadian hydropower are increasingly being recognized in Canada. In particular, in the Canadian Senate, Senator Mary Jane McCollum has asked for an investigation into the cumulative impacts of energy extraction, including hydro, on the development, on people and the environment. She notes that the adverse impacts of resource extraction continue to occur at an, at an alarming rate, both in breadth and scope, despite protests from communities. She notes that it's crucial that proper consideration be given to the colonialism that exists in relation to the land and its resources, both past, past and present for local communities in Canada. So who's behind Chippy? Well, first, of course, we have the government of Quebec and Hydro-Quebec together. They're one. It's a state-owned monopoly. They build dams and sell electricity. In New York on Wall Street, we have the Blackstone Group that rose out of the ashes of Lehman Brothers, the failed Wall Street financier. Blackstone Group wants to build Chippy $3, million, $3 billion. They're trying to tap into COVID stimulus funds and New York City's bonding authority for this project, funds that at this time should be going to struggling Americans, not to big corporations and the Canadian government. We have Stephen Schwartzman, the president of Blackstone. On the board of Blackstone, we have the former Canadian Premier Mulroney. They have set up a shell corporation, TDI, whose president is Don Jessam, and under that they have various shell corporations with the name Chipping. There are unseemly political connections between Blackstone, the New York City Mayor's Office, and politicians and the government of Quebec. This is displayed very accurately on the government of Quebec's filings with the U.S. Department of Justice, which is, it is required to do on a periodic basis. For example, in January of 2020, the government of Quebec explained the millions of dollars that it was spending in the U.S. to promote hydroelectricity and other pro products from Quebec. You'll see here that they've documented uh, meetings with New York regulators who have authority over Chippy's approval with various so-called environmental groups and with politicians, including their meeting with the Coalition of Northeast Governors. We're here really today to focus on the rerouting proposal that Blackstone has presented to the regulators in New York. But I do wanna to touch on the fact that this is dirty energy. Hydroelectricity from Hydro-Quebec dams should be treated like fossil fuels, according to peer-reviewed science. These dams destroy carbon sequestering forests, and rivers themselves that are crucial to storing carbon. The $3 billion Chippy Corridor itself is a greenhouse gas nightmare. Years of construction using fossil fuel driven equipment under rivers and public roads. Canadian dams cause methylmercury poisoning of the environment. 
the Harvard study from 2016 studied 22 new dams proposed for across Canada and concluded that Hydro-Quebec's new Romaine Dam that's under construction as we speak would have the highest levels of methylmercury contamination and this would prevent, present the largest risk of unacceptable methylmercury exposure of Indigenous communities of all of the 22 dams. So turning back to the corridor route and the new regulatory approvals that are needed. Back in 2013, Chippy, as a result of a settlement of pr proposal between an elite group of nonprofits led to a permit from the Public Service Commission. The project was never fully vetted. There was never a full evidentiary hearing on crucial issues such as the greenhouse gas emissions of the project and of Hydro-Quebec's electricity. There was never an evidentiary hearing on the impacts in Canada on the environment and local communities. Now, Blackstone is trying to reroute, reroute the pro project and in eight different lo locations and to move the converter station location in Queens, New York. These are material substantial changes that require a new environmental impact study under state and federal law and a full public vetting and review, particularly in light of the new scientific evidence about the greenhouse gas impacts of Hydro-Quebec's electricity. There are also problems with the location of the border crossing. These maps that I will show are just two of the rerouting locations. One, this is up in New York, and there is another alternative to move the corridor out of the river and through Schenectady. NAMR's position is that the days of Canadian mega dams are over. This power cannot be greenwashed any longer. We have to reject the racist colonialism that supports this form of energy extraction and move towards a more just and equitable energy economy. With that, I will turn the screen over to Denise Cole, who will introduce herself, and she's located in Labrador. Hello, everybody. So while we're uh, doing that switch over there, uh, I would like us to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge that we are all on unceded um, traditional indigenous lands, wherever we are right now. Where I am in Labrador is the uh, traditional lands of the Innu and the Inuit. And uh, so certainly wherever each of you are, are also on traditional lands and I always want us to to remember that because um, there's a lot to be said for how things have become moving forward so we're gonna uh, I have some slides here I'm gonna let you read the slides and I'm really going to sort of uh, talk to some of the things that we spoke about earlier today as we I met with some of the other uh, group through NAMRA so Grand River Keeper Labrador is uh, my direct connection in as a board member but also uh, as a communications person within the Labrador Land Protectors but I'm also an indigenous uh, Inuk two-spirit who grew up in southern Labrador who lives now in Goose Bay and, and is 20 uh, well 30 kilometers downstream from uh, the Muskrat Falls mega dam and um, so this has a very personal piece for me and that's what I wanted to talk about and I will remind us that whether this is Hydro-Quebec or Manitoba Hydro or any other Canadian uh, Crown Corporation or, or Hydro entity, Nelcor is the energy uh, corporation here in Newfoundland and Labrador. We have seen decades of the same tactics and we will hear companies who will talk about and Crown Corporations who are gonna talk about consent and how they achieved this consent or consultation. And so this is, a, I guess I'm not going to read all of this, I'll allow you to just to, to read our bulleted pieces here, because really the reality is, is that over the decades, how environmental assessment processes have changed and how governments have manipulated 
to obtain this uh, so-called uh, government colonial consent of use of lands. So if we look back at, uh, you know, Churchill Falls, for example, uh, there was no such thing as a standardized sort of consultation or consent process that uh, is reflected in what we talk about now when we look at things like United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples, which has still not come into full legislation here in Canada. And we think it's very much because of their fears of what duty to consult really will look like and the idea of free prior and informed consent. And many times when consultation is done, it's done with colonial indigenous elected uh, leaderships. And that does not necessarily translate to full understanding from indigenous peoples who live in communities who have to bear the, the majority of the weight of impacts from mega dams. We know firsthand that they are not green, they are not clean, uh, and they certainly, the level of destruction, not just to habitat and to food webs and to river and land systems, but also to spiritual and cultural sacred spaces and the deep impact that has us, on us as indigenous peoples who are trying to heal in a land that has been barbarized by colonial contacts. So when they talk about energy, it's certainly not the energy that feeds our spirits or our next generations. So uh, these are some of the things around this destruction, uh, the bullet points that are there. And we certainly have to look at the realities. We have some of the highest rates of missing and murdered indigenous women. We know what man camps do. We know how drugs come into our communities, how it escalates the cost of living, and uh, how many times when we try to resist said projects on our lands, the Crown Corporations are very quick to work with uh, colonial legal systems to gain injunctions which prevent us from being able to protect lands that are originally ours. Uh, so some of the you know, community impacts that we see from this are the ones that are listed here. And this list is just a very short, compacted list. Uh, one of the things I would like to touch on as you're sort of reading uh, these bullets is I know this is particularly about transmission lines. And while we're directly downstream from the Musgrave Falls Hydro Project, which is phase one of a two phase Lower Churchill project, we have been living with transmission line impacts that go all the way back to the Churchill Falls Dam. And including this new transmission line that was built from Muskrat Falls to Newfoundland. I mean, it involves subsea cables that now have stretched, one of them stretches over to Nova Scotia. And we know that uh, all of the hydro companies that are involved in this are looking for corridors and looking for transmission lines that go through sensitive habitats and lands. And again, how these environmental assessment processes are done. I know for us here in Labrador with the Lower Churchill Project, it wasn't even a hearing based. You could only give written submissions. So you couldn't even really stand up for yourselves to say, these transmission lines, for example, have gone through calving areas of an endangered species, which is our caribou. They have uh, going through very sensitive uh, water areas that have different species of plant life that are nowhere else. And uh, there's never been this consideration of the impacts that has for, for us who, uh, who are the original caretakers of these lands. And then there's herbicides that get used that do go into water systems. They'll tell you that they set up buffers. They'll tell you that this has all been mitigated. Uh, but I can tell you that that is a part of the, uh, the greenwashing that happens with hydro projects. Hydro projects to me are, are the same way that fossil fuels were touted as replacements for coal back in the day. Um, they're certainly not green for us and for anyone else that they're involved with. So I really commend NAMRA on bringing people together to speak truth to power about this. So the last thing that I'll touch on, because I'm aware we have other speakers and I certainly want to give uh, much time to them and to their points of view, I'd like us to sort of consider the two key points that we see for the Muskrat Falls Dam, that in the consultation stages, these are points that were raised and in the environmental assessment hearing stages, uh, which was really the only consultation that many of us were able to be any part of. And even with that, government can also just sort of veto it out and say, we appreciate that these are recommendations, but we're gonna move forward anyway. 
So I really am wary of, of companies that say, we, we did the consultation and, and we got the green light to do this. Those green lights usually come from government, not from people. So things that came up, even though they were brought up in the environmental assessment stage is the methylmercury contamination. So that Harvard report that Meg had referenced is a, an amazing uh, piece of research work that I uh, really encourage you to look at. And then we also have the North Spur, which uh, we've always known to be a very unstable part of a natural uh, sort of dam system on the Churchill River right at Muskrat Falls. Nelcor has manipulated that to say that it will stabilize. We have outside independent experts who say it's a risk and uh, it's created a new flood zone downstream that puts potentially a thousand lives at risk, you know, which again, what we understand from company and government is that death of people downstream or poisoning of people downstream is a byproduct of mega dams that they're okay with because they continue to allow it. So when you poison the traditional food web, what you do is you destroy something that's been for us in time memorial of how we sustain our health and we sustain cultural practices. So when you have government people who say, just eat less fish, that's a huge insult. And uh, you know, we look at, for example, what's been happening in the States around COVID and how uh, you know, the president came forward and brought in legislation that prevented meat plants from being able to close because meat was so important to the diet. But yet we're told in Canada that it's okay to lose this hugely fundamental, not just one meat product, but an entire food web. So uh, something to consider and the fact that now we are at risk of also damn failure. So the bottom line has always been the ignoring of anybody experts besides the ones that the company has bought and paid for. We have so many broken promises. They said they were gonna clear the reservoir and then they didn't. Uh, we have constantly had lip service from both company and government and they really cover each other's butts if you'll excuse the language, but that's really what happens. And then they tie us up in legal systems. So climate change is a reality of mega hydro. It is not a clean energy. And uh, we hope that you will continue to join in solidarity with us as we push back and just demand that government, company, municipalities, states, and provinces all start looking at smaller footprint projects that are more sustainable, that give long-term sustainability and vision and plans to people who live in communities, instead of helping to fill the, uh, the wallets of uh, companies and corporations and, and big investors. And with that, I will pass it back over and thank you for this opportunity, Nakamik in my language, and uh, I look forward to hearing more from everyone else as well. Thank you very much, Denise. And thank you for the land acknowledgement as well <laughs> and for your new perspective. Our next speaker is Jackie Dreschler, who will speak to us from her community where Chippy is going to be rerouted. She'll talk to you about some of the changes that in the rerouting proposal that she's concerned about. Thank you, Jackie? and I'm sorry I was Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can everyone? Okay. So I'm sorry I wasn't able to get onto Zoom and I even dressed up for it, but um, thank you for letting me be a part of today's uh, conference call. Um, I live in Valley Cottage in Rockland County, New York, right near the Tappan Zee Bridge on the Hudson, along the Hudson River. And I'm calling um, in today regarding Stony Point and Havistraw and Route 9W. And Stony Point and Havistraw are both very vibrant and diverse communities, and they're going to be greatly affected by this project. So what I want to talk about first are these route changes. Um, what Chippy seems to be doing is they're, they're doing route changes without um, informing the public um, or having any plans on file. Um, for instance, um, um, we, uh, Chippy has never responded to the New York State Department of Transportation's request to a reply from their letter dated May 1st regarding the concerns that the Department of Transportation has. And I will just read from those letters. Um, they say that the location of the proposed pipeline has brought up some 
concerns um, concerning the the location of the right of way. They want basically 60 feet of right of way from that line on both sides of the road, which takes into account the possibility of em eminent domain, which I'll get to later. Um, the, they're supposed to um, perform soil borings and other soil investigations. Um, they are supposed to get justification for the open cut method of construction. They are supposed to have a maintenance and protection and traffic plan and a restoration plan. Um, they are very concerned, the Department of uh, Transportation, that this project is going to create severe traffic impact, severe. They have not responded to that. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, they, regarding environmental um, management and construction plans and best practice plans, they have not been provided to the PSC. And how is it possible that we, the people, um, the business, the community at large, the town, how can we possibly measure the impacts and consequences, anticipated and unanticipated consequences, without having even an in, you know, even another hearing? We are being denied the right to have a hearing um, on this issue. This this project in Rockland County started 10 years ago and it has changed significantly since then. So the commission must address how the right of way for Chippy will be managed. And um, we, we have the right to know about that. Um, so then we have, um, quite honestly, on the um, environmental management and construction plan, um, they are supposed to say, how many transmission lines are going to be there, what the size and capacity of each cable is, and they haven't done that either. Okay, then we have the letter um, that, um, that, they, that the Department of Transportation has written to uh, Honorable Kathleen Berg, Berkus, the Secretary of the Commission, um, where it, it says, and I'm quoting all of these things, it has become apparent that some of the applicants proposed adjustments will have unacceptable impact on Route 9W in Rockland County. So now I'm going to go on to some of those other, other things. So the right of way uh, could mean that there will be the taking of residential and business properties, land by eminent domain, because this is a big, broad right of way. In Rockland County, many homes and businesses are right on 9W. Um, and 9W is a major heartline road through Rockland County. Um, it, it goes totally from, from um, north, north to south. And this is a, a heartline for businesses and for um, transportation. And when there's a traffic incident, 9W gets basically shut down into a traffic jam and no one can go anywhere. And then all of the feeder roads get jammed up. So it affects the entire county when there's an incident. There's also the possibility, and it has happened, that emergency vehicles can't get through. This is a very dangerous, mostly two-lane road. Um, I personally have a, a story that I was getting my sister to the Helen Hayes Hospital, which is one of the best rehabilitation hospitals on the East Coast. Um, people come from all over the world to, to be here. And we, we got stuck in a traffic jam that lasted three hours. And the DOT said it wasn't their fault, and the town said it wasn't their fault. And three hours, of course, we missed the appointment. And for some people, that is a matter of life and death, okay? So this is a very tight area. Um, so I, the, the other fact is that it's going to have a huge economic impact on the businesses. There are many mom and pop stores. There are many new little restaurants. and we are having a massive issue, um, major losses due to COVID with businesses closing. We've had over 650 deaths in Rockland County and people's lives are really being destroyed. There are many losses here. And um, to have this happen on top of that could really be the nail in the coffin for certain areas, including Stony Point and Havistraw. 
we are also very concerned about quality of life for residents um, whose lives may be very harmed by traffic and noise and the particulate matter and these roads are fragile, as well as for all of the wildlife. Um, but it's the, the fact that there may not be a real recovery after COVID and then having this is, is really of great concern. Um, okay, and so then I personally have a big concern about the hotline. So um, this hotline right now is a thousand megawatts and they're saying that they have, um, if I can find it, uh, they are saying that they have an interest um, in, in upping that to 1,250. And um, I have a letter, um, uh, Baker Bot's response to the Department of Energy um, from May 22nd, 2020. And this letter states, um, while Chippy is considering increasing the capacity of this project, any increase would be subject to prior review and approval by the Department of Energy. This would necessitate subsequent application to Department of Energy by CHIPS-B. It must be publicly noticed and commenter, commenters would have an opportunity to comment on the proposal. So any comments on the potential expansion of the project's capacity at this point are premature. So there's so many things wrong with this project. Um, the hotline issue um is very concerning because these lines have the possibility of arcing and creating fires and so here in rockland county you know we've dealt with indian point we've dealt with many projects with the bomb trains um and so where is the insurance to cover a catastrophe should one happen to to this community will the will our communities be forced to suck it up and pay for remediation and pay for everything that's needed in a catastrophe you know, we have an emergency management plan. Where is Chippy? Um, and what would they be providing to people, to emergency services, first responders, residents and business owners and services, um, materials and finances? The, you know, properties may get damaged. There's, there's a real consideration here of that issue. I'm glad that it's not landing at Indian Point because then there's even more of a serious problem. So I have just a uh, two more things to discuss. Um, one is the potential blasting um, in Rockland County. So although Rockland County seems to be a strong county and we are Rockland, they don't call us Rockland for nothing. Um, further along on 9W heading south, there are, um, there are fallen rock zones. We are the Palisades Cliff. Um, and I worry that the blasting could create instability along what we call the Palisades. Um, and moreover, this project is going to be being done in very close proximity to Helen Hayes Hospital. And um, this could potentially harm people, it could potentially harm the hospital, um, and of course, the wildlife. I'm also concerned about the blasting on um, the underwater ridge at Iona Island, where eagles live. Eagles are protected species. Um, once they are harmed by noise, they generally don't come back. So that is another issue. Um, another issue, um, and I'm just going to read now um, a statement that was from Riverkeeper, and this goes back to um, the danger of these mega dams and the, the horrible situations that they create for the people in Canada. Um, so Riverkeeper here in, Rock, in um, New York withdrew its initial support for the permitting of the Champlain Hudson Power Express, citing the changing energy landscape in New York State. That includes the advancement of renewable energy due to soon come online and reductions in overall energy demand today that's drastically changed since April 2013 when Riverkeeper originally supported this project. And that was after receiving assurances that it would not lead to the construction of new dams in Canada. It now seems evident that Chippy is likely to increase the risk of a new dam by increasing, you know, their megawatts, which would lead to greater river and habitat destruction, as well as additional negative impact to the health, quality of life, and cultural identity of Canada's indigenous communities. So we are very, very much opposed to this. There's 
one other, um, I mean, there's so many things I'd like to address, and I know that there are other speakers, so I'm just going to um, talk about one other thing here, which is um, this electromagnetic field issue. Um, there's no plan. Apparently, they have no plan to address this electromagnetic field issue. Their plan is they will be neutralized because they go north to south. And I'm wondering where they got this information from, maybe just from Google, where it talks about how dogs use the Earth's magnetic field to relieve themselves. I don't know that this is a plan. Many people have serious health concerns regarding EMFs. And uh, the fact that Chippy is interested in raising the wattage to uh, 1,250 megawatts is of concern. So um, in closing, uh, I hope, I hope I've given some information regarding Rockland County and some of our concerns. Um, that my real biggest concern is the issue of eminent domain and the knife in the heart to businesses and residents who live along this corridor. Thank you. And how unnecessary this is because we know that with Indian Point closed, there's, there's still no need for extra power coming through. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. You're welcome. Thank you. So our next speaker is Wilden Fishman, and I will let her introduce herself. You got on mute. each other on the unmute. That's good. Hey, the New York Solar Energy Society's mission has always been for 14 years to educate children and families about energy efficiency and renewable energy. So even working with STEM kids, the STEM, the, the educational system there is, is dilapidated. Common Core doesn't mention energy efficiency or renewable energy once. Now, there's a, a term, a funny little term called the energy you don't use. Negawatt. A negawatt is like a negative watt. It's the watt that's, that's not used. So it's not wasted either. And the New York Solar Energy Society has seen New York claim, oh, we're going to do community solar. And then New York Solar Energy Society does not see the permits being issued. Oh, we're going to do offshore wind. Now Orsted's the winner and they're just gonna go out there and do this thing. We just need to bring that. And then nothing happens. And this goes on decade after decade. So about, when Mayor Bloomberg was in office, it, he had the decency to put in a benchmarking of all buildings and what energy they were using, and we're supposed to ratchet that down. Mayor de Blasio was able to announce the three winners of the most waste that comes out of our buildings. Number one, boilers that aren't tweaked. Number two, air conditioners hanging out of windows, even in winter. That's a cold metal box sitting in a window. What kind of insulation is that? And then we have very antique lighting. So the waste begins right here at home, in our homes and in our buildings. But talked about, talk about landlords and landlords with these apartments that are so fallen down, they even have mold in them. Can you see these buildings need renovating and there's no incentive? So we're wasting all this energy, which makes me feel, as many of you did probably in the beginning of this presentation, just really angry that we have to bring down a whole ecosystem to bring some uh, thousand watts into Queens, New York, while all this is going on. How do we curtail waste when all these apartments are in dire need of, of repair. At the same time, 
the city's not moving, even with COVID-19. Granted, there's no jet noise to speak of. People are Im immobilized here in the city still. We, we don't have much opening up anywhere. Uh, but how will we park and charge our electric vehicles? Nothing's been done about that. So the electric cable will take electrons to New York City at great cost, while our lifestyle just swings. And we're supposed to be swinging towards using less energy. So this cable will lose energy itself in between the dam or wherever the electrons are up there. And that big long cable coming down to New York, there's electricity that just disappears out of, maybe it's only 6%, maybe it's 8%, nobody knows for sure. The cable hasn't been, we haven't been informed what they're going to be using for cable to carry 1,000 or 1,250 megawatts. So uh, that cable can also be reversed, I just found out today. We could wind up sending electricity that away. So we have to look at this utility and how much they will charge New Yorkers. We're used to paying 17 to 22 cents for a kilowatt of energy. They're only charging us 10 cents or even less. How can that be? And the great dig in between those miles are huge. So let me leave it there and thank you, Meg and everyone. So far, we have more speakers for you now. Thank you very much, Weldon. And our next speaker is Peter Kelly Detweiler. Yeah, hi, thank you for uh, inviting me to the conversation. I've been in energy markets for 30 years and in fact, cut my teeth um, with the Goodman Group. I first learned about energy um, when I joined the Goodman Group and they were energy experts and I was not. And we were engaged by the Grand Council Decree in 1990 to uh, help make arguments that would forestall the need for uh, import contracts to New York and to New England, Vermont and, and Massachusetts uh, specifically. So here I am, you know, almost 30 years later, which, which tells you, you know, you, you never get away from anything. Uh, and so, you know, looking at this, <clears throat> Meg had me do some work for NAMRA a couple months ago, looking at this big picture. And the question at hand was, with respect to Chippy, and then the NECEC, the New England Clean Energy Connect line coming in, uh, which should be serving Massachusetts with, and we're talking like, there's a lot of different numbers. And one thing I understand the, in this space is that we speak in a lot of jargon, and I apologize for that. Over 30 years, you kind of get brainwashed into that logic because you have to be. So when you talk about things like terawatt hours, it's almost impossible to imagine what that is, but that's the language we speak. And so this thing would be essentially, you know, uh, New England would be nine terawatt hours, New York somewhere in the, in the eight terawatt hour range, and potentially more if you upgrade that 250 additional megawatts of lines. Long and the short is <clears throat> right now, Hydro-Quebec is exporting spot market electricity that's sold every single day, not in firm contracts. It's just sold into the market, whatever the spot market real-time price is, they sell power into the marketplace. And then in addition to that, they made a commitment to New Brunswick just to sell them a lot of power. And then on top of that, they're making all these additional commitments to New York and New England. At the same time that they're saying, well, we're not going to have to build new dams. But at the same time, they're saying, well, we're going to finish up phase four of the Romaine complex. And then in some of their internal documents, it says, and we will look at additional hydro or other resources as necessary to meet future needs while they're saying, we're not gonna need new dams to meet additional export commitments. So you kind of can't have it both ways. At one point they say, we're not gonna back down our existing exports, but we're gonna serve all these new commitments, but we're not gonna build any new dams. That, in that sense, the simple math, you can take away all the complexity and the logic simply doesn't hold up. And that's what, you know, Meg and I went through <laughs> all the documents, me for a long, long time, and sorted through all of their statements and pronouncements and the planning documents, and essentially, that's what you arrive at. And the interesting thing was, I did that analysis on my own, and then I happened to run into the, the CEO at Energist, for Energist, 
who was doing similar work for the New York uh, independent power producers. And I, I saw her, Tanya Bordell, at a, at a conference, and I said, Hell, oh, I saw you just released this report. I'm doing something, and here's what I found. And she looked at me and just started laughing and saying, We've come to exactly the same place, which didn't surprise me because it's really the only place you can come to. Their, their, their conclusion was exactly the same thing. You either back down your existing spot market exports and fill those in with these firm contracts, in which case your commitment to reduce global emissions don't change, or you're adding these to your existing sales, in which case you have to build new resources. It's either one or the other. It really comes down to that. Yeah, there's different numbers. There's spillage. Some years they have more water that go over the dams because of more rainfall, et cetera. But, but that's kind of all noise. When you really boil down to it, it comes down to that essential thesis. So that's sort of part one of the, the conversation. Part two of the conversation is, all right, back to the discussion around energy efficiency and other opportunities out there. So if you were to take uh, LED lighting, for example, and put it in everywhere where you had incandescence, you could reduce your lighting use by 75%. Because essentially an incandescent light bulb is a heater masquerading as a light source. 95% of the electricity that moves through an incandescent light bulb is wasted in the form of heat. Because essentially what it does is those electrons move through a tungsten filament. The, fil the filament doesn't like it, essentially, and resists that, and it warms up until it glows and then creates light. But you can't touch an incandescent light bulb because it's so hot because you've heated your house with it. Remember the Easy Bake oven we used to have as kids? where You actually could cook a muffin with a waste heat from a 60-watt light bulb? That's what we're talking about. So same thing with efficient motors, more insulation, all those. So lot of room for energy efficiency. Then if you do look at the renewable side, that 9,000 megawatts of offshore commitments eventually will get built. And I know that because I spent a lot of time with the developers in the wind space and looking at what's happening with the permits and the first permitting uh, for the Massachusetts wind farms will be done this year and they'll start building those things to be delivering in 2024. You see costs of wind come down from, say, four years ago, the Block Island wind farm was $244 a megawatt hour, which is pretty expensive power. But the last projects was one was 6.8 or 6.5 cents a kilowatt hour, so roughly a quarter of that price. And then the one after that was 5.8 cents a kilowatt hour. And we're seeing projects off of the UK in this massive project in the Dogger Bank, where we're coming down at 5 cents a kilowatt hour. So there is this inexorable curve on the wind side. Then if you look at the solar side, I was on the phone yesterday because I'm working on this 350 page book on this whole thing called the energy switch. And I was talking to the, one of the leading practitioners in the country who tests solar panels for efficiency and, and what they're gonna, how they're gonna perform 25 years in the environment. And his comment was, there are so many innovations going on right now in R&D in China, in Malaysia, Vietnam, the US, elsewhere, that every year we're seeing an increase in efficiencies in the solar panels of a half a percent every single year. That's been going on for the last 10 years, and it's predictably gonna go on for the next visible future, at least the next five or 10. So the cost of solar panels continue to come down, and then batteries, the cost of batteries have fallen by 50% just in the last two years. So one of the arguments I make quite often before regulators and energy planners is, if you're talking about making these multi-billion dollar investments, including offshore wind, you gotta be really thoughtful about how big your commitments are and how much optionality and flexibility you're keeping in place in a world where if we truly think about it, the solar industry did not exist 10 years ago. We've built 800 times the solar that we had 10 years ago. The wind industry also didn't really exist in terms of volumes a decade ago and the battery industry, when we look back 10 years from today, we won't even see on a chart what's installed this year or last year. And to give you how much, how quickly that's changing, one company indicates that in 2021, it will install a billion dollars worth of batteries, which would be sufficient to power the entire state of Rhode Island for four hours. That's way more than all the installed battery capacity that exists in the country today. That's how fast all this is changing. 
That's all, all I do all day. I read two to four hours a day and just track trends and speed and business models and installation numbers. And so the bottom line on that one is the longer you can hold off making these commitments, the faster the world is accelerating to a cleaner economy with better technology and smarter business models and even behavioral changes as well. So that's my imprecation is hold off. Anything we can do to delay these things buys us flexibility, which gives us a better possible energy future, even just a few years from today. So that's my thesis. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Peter. That's really interesting and encouraging. And I love how it talks, feeds into um, Golden's point about megawatts. Absolutely. So we are done. Uh, we are done a little bit early here, so we have plenty of time for questions um, on the call.